Welcome to the backstory on one of the lowest profile but highest stakes needs in Longmont and every other community in the United States. My name is Tim Waters and I've been invited by the Longmont Observer and Longmont Public Media to moderate conversations of leaders, advocates, experts, and policymakers on topics of interest and relevance to Longmont area residents. This month we're focusing on young families and our youngest residents, concerned that we're failing too many of both because of insufficient child care and early childhood learning opportunities in Longmont. Every story that each of us reads about in newspapers or on the Longmont Observer website has a backstory. And the backstory is frequently more interesting than the story we read about and report it as news. So this month we're telling the story that's understood all too well by moms and dads and grandparents of children and grandchildren under the age of six. It's a story that's less well understood by business owners, although we'll learn from one of our panelists that that's changing. Our business community is coming to this, this issue and this need in a far more enlightened way um, than maybe in past years. The implications for municipalities, for school boards, and for county commissioners are, are significant because for every goal that a school board or a city council or a county commissioner would set, if we don't get it right for the youngest of our residents, if we don't do more and better for our youngest residents, our children zero to five, then virtually everything else is more difficult to achieve. So this is a backstory on a, on a challenge that's so complex and so pervasive and of such consequence and significance that we're telling it in a series of at least three podcasts. These will be produced and, po and posted in sequence on the Longmont Observer and the Longmont Public Media websites. They'll stream off a YouTube channel in hopes that Longmont and Boulder County residents will understand what's at stake for all of us if we don't get it right for the youngest of us. So for this podcast, I'm joined by a pretty remarkable panel. Um, people who are deeply involved with this and bring their own expertise and talent. And I'd like to start by introducing Marta Lochman, a former teacher in the St. Vrain Valley School District, a small business owner, a mom who has firsthand experience with the accessibility and cost of child care, and happens to be a candidate for Boulder County Commissioner. So Thanks for the invite. I'm so welcome. glad to be here with everybody. Lorena Garcia, Executive Director of the Colorado Statewide Parent Coalition, uh, she happens to be also running for an office. She's a candidate for the United States Senate. And uh, she has a, a powerful story to tell about her work and, and what's been happening for the last couple of decades, actually, to build capacity in this state uh, to respond to the needs of young families, uh, both in formal and informal child care settings. Melanie Piazza is a co-founder of and executive director of the Family Village, which is located in Longmont. It's a child care uh, co-op, uh, shared workspace, uh, and uh, an opportunity for, for young moms to stay engaged professionally and also see that their kids are well cared for. So uh, a, an interesting, I don't know if it's unique, but a very unusual model exists right here in Longmont. And Gloria Higgins, who is a co-founder of Executives Partnering in, uh, to Invest in Children, EPIC. Uh, EPIC is a coalition of business interests. She, she'll tell the story. It starts uh, following the Denver Preschool uh, Initiative, uh, in which she was the initial chair. Uh, Gloria now works with and through EPIC as a consultant. She works with communities throughout Colorado to bring the business community to this issue and to bring the issue to the business community. So welcome to all four of you. Thanks for doing this. I know you could be doing other things with your, with your time, but this is a gift to this community, and, and I appreciate it. I know others will. Before we get into content, there's way more of your stories to tell than what I just did. So why don't you do your own self-introduction, what brings you to this, and then we'll get into the content of this conversation. Who wants to start? We'll just go right to left. All right. Um, so again, I'm Melanie Piazza, and I founded Family Village, which is a cooperative, co-working community and child care center here in Longmont. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, I was a mom of two young kids and had kept telling myself, my gosh, I just need some space to do something for myself, start thinking about what I want to do in terms of building a business. And also, I was really missing community and connection with other moms. Um, but the um, cost of childcare was so prohibitive that I couldn't find space for myself. 
And I just kept imagining, wouldn't it be great if there was a place I could go and I could do things for myself, I could meet with other parents, and I could know my kids were taken care of in the same location, but I'm not the one taking care of them. Um, and I got angry enough that it didn't exist that I just decided I'm going to put it out there and um, a bunch of moms on Facebook agreed that they could use it as well. Lots of dads as well. Um, so we were founded in June of um, 2018 and are currently located at 1303 South Bross Lane. Um, and um, we're just a place for um, childcare to be a little bit different. So it's cooperative in that we are all as members, um, owners of the business. We have a full-time child care provider, our child care director is there all the time, and then we support her in taking care of our kids as it ebbs and flows. We're a drop-in center, so we have no idea how many kids are coming at what time. Um, and we have lots of volunteers, a lot of elder volunteers who are interested in engaging with young kids because they don't have theirs anymore. Um, and so it's really a community-based uh, center. And part of the reason it works is because there are a lot of parents who are working remotely. Boulder County is now the number one county in the country for remote working population. And so there are a lot of parents who say, this is great, I'm gonna get to work at home and I can have my kids and it's the perfect situation. And we always joke that you start to get tired of taking phone calls from the closet because your kids inevitably make noise the moment that you need to take an <laughs> important phone call. Mm -hmm. So um, we sort of become the opportunity for parents to take the time that they need in small chunks, we can offer three hours of care per day. Um, we can go into more of that later, why it's only three hours a day. Um, but it gives parents the, the chance to do those things that they need to do to run their business, run their lives, get their sanity back, um, especially really new moms who feel, oh my gosh, we thought parenting was, was gonna be so easy and it's really not. Um, and it helps to hear other parents who have been in it to um, say, yeah, it is hard, you're not wrong, this is not just you. Um, so yeah, we're the first of, a, um, of our kind in the country. There have been co-working spaces um, with childcare attached um, that have been some successful, some unsuccessful, but I think what makes us different is that we're a cooperative. Um, and so parents are much more engaged in the whole, not just the childcare, but the operation of a business. So it's making parents who are feeling lost um, in terms of their identity have a purpose again and there a lot of people are finding a career that they didn't know existed um, before they started coming to the village so um, yeah that's my my story and that's what family village is glad to be here wonderful yeah and I had the delight to go over and meet Melanie and see what she's been doing and it's when you talk about unique and opportunities it really speaks to the entrepreneur um, thread of Boulder County, but certainly in, in our city of Longmont. So my name is Martha Lotramin, and as you shared, I am a candidate for Boulder County Commissioner. And, and Gloria and I were speaking earlier that we have multiple hats, and a lot of that is our story, um, our stories as women. Um, so as a single parent, I've navigated the system of, you know, the same thought of like, oh, maybe this will get easier as my kids get older. And the reality is that the child care needs change, um, certainly from being initially employed by a corporation where I had uh, maternity leave and I had benefits and I had time off with my um, my oldest son. And then when I went to self-employment in 2001, and a lot of our community deals with that, is when you don't have benefits and you don't have child care options, I had to go back to work a week later because I was self-employed and I was the only person working for my household. And so those are that's an experience and perspective that I bring as well as, as you mentioned, um, that I am a, also a teacher. And so from a family perspective and doing a family engagement and consulting around the, the community now um, doing work is really talking about one of the things that I know we're gonna talk about later is how do we involve parents in this conversation um, to a higher degree? How do we, um, and one of the requests initially for why I was invited was from the um, business community perspective. And so how do we bridge all of our voices mm -hmm. together to address what you talked about already, this very important need and more pressing intertwining issue of all of our big issues. How do we focus that into the early childhood ed? So thanks for having me here. Thanks for being here. Gloria. And my name is Gloria Higgins and I'm personally a CPA by training. Um, so I, I grew up in the business community, understand the perspective of the business community, and through that was asked to become the board chair for the Denver Preschool Program, which was one of the first uh, public taxing initiatives that was passed in Colorado, and I think maybe across the nation. The challenge that we had, and I think the reason I was asked to participate, was the fact that we were starting from scratch. 
we had millions of dollars coming in on day one, January one, and we had no um, methodology of getting that money back out to the community in, in, a, in a real way. So it was that entrepreneurial spirit and the very strong board that was handed to me with the expertise in early childhood, expertise in education, expertise in some of the community issues that we were able to create um, a sliding scale methodology for transferring sales tax dollars in the city and county of Denver to parents for the benefit of their four-year-old in a preschool or an early education setting. Mm -hmm. So that sold me. I gave up being a CPA and decided that my third career was going to be as an advocate for early childhood. And my background was with communities, so that's where I've landed. Well, there's lots to, to learn from that experience across the state, and we're trying to learn it here. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so thank you. <clears throat> I'm really excited to be part of this panel of a lot of expertise. Thank you, Tim, for inviting me. Um, again, my name is Lorena Garcia, and I am the executive director of the Colorado Statewide Parent Coalition. And CSPC was founded 40 years ago by a group of parents that felt like the education system wasn't meeting their needs. So they self-organized, started to train each other on how to be advocates for their children in schools. And through that, the organization grew to reach parents statewide. Um, in 2001, the organization was finally able to bring on staff. And in 2005, what was um, the organization went from being a 100% parent-serving organization into expanding to serve school districts, schools, as well as child care providers. Because there was conversation with parents that, yes, I'm going to do everything that I can, but my kid is not always with me. Mm -hmm. My child is in a child care provider, provider setting, whether it's licensed or if it's informal. And so there's only so much I can do. So through a grant, the Colorado Statewide Parent Coalition was unable to do some research here in Boulder County to identify where are those kids going. And it was discovered that a large percentage were going to informal child care providers, the, the providers that we consider babysitters. You know, they're the, the grandparents or the neighbor down the street or the family friend. And there was a desire within that population to improve their skill sets so that they could also support the educational and school readiness development of these young children. So from that, CSPC developed a very rigorous, intensive training for what we call FFN providers, which are friend, family, and neighbor care providers. And right now, this training, um, we're, what are we, 14 years later, We've trained over 1,300 FFN providers across um, across the state. We're on 160 of them here in Longmont, <clears throat> and um, it's a it's a program that has proven success in the sense that we also have an external evaluation that shows that the children in the care of PASO providers have a 17 point increase in their school readiness scores. I mean that one of the things that we often say is our efforts of closing the achievement gap is to close it before it starts. And we do that by empowering parents, empowering FFN providers, and making sure that, that there is support in the community and there's the, the constant growing of skill sets. Because yeah, I think someone mentioned you, 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 you don't become a parent and suddenly know how to parent. You don't become a child care provider and suddenly know how to provide mm -hmm. child care. Yeah. We all need support. We all need encouragement. We all need skills development. We'll see where the conversation goes. I've got some questions I'm going to ask, but um, it won't. It, 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 I would delight if we come back at some point uh, to the to the effects of closing the kinds of gaps that we know children arrive at the kindergarten door with mm -hmm. in terms of vocabulary, mm -hmm. planning skills, problem solving skills, delayed gratification, the kinds of things that get developed in in quality early learning experiences, and what that means to them for the rest of their lives in school and, and as adults and all of the costs associated with it. So if we get there, you know, that's, uh, that's part of why we should be in this conversation. I just want to remind um, anybody who is a listener to this or, or tunes in, uh, th their city of Longmont, uh, the city council, and, and listeners know that I, I do this as a volunteer. I also serve on the city council, so sometimes it's hard to know which hat you're wearing. Just to remind listeners that the, the Longmont City Council has adopted a couple of vision statements and seven goal statements. 
And among the goal statements are a goal about housing, and there's a goal about economic development, um, and goals about the environment and the kinds of community in which we want to live. We also have a goal that we are going to provide more and better early learning experiences for all of our children. The premise for this series and the work that's going on right now in Longmont as a coalition comes together around this topic, the premise is that if we don't get it right for our youngest residents, every other goal that we want to achieve becomes more difficult to achieve. Or conversely, if we do get it right, attaining or achieving the other goals in terms of housing and economic development and uh, quality of life are all enhanced or strengthened. Our chances of success are, are much improved. So the first of these podcasts focused kind of on big picture. Uh, the second of these podcasts really focused on kind of formal and informal early learning opportunities for four and five year olds. Uh, so we can go wherever we want to, but I really would like to drill down on that zero to three age group, child care, mm -hmm. um, because there's so much learning and development that occurs there, but in less formal settings, but no less important in terms of life preparation. So, um, so we'll see. I'll, I'm going to ask some questions. We'll see where we go with these questions and how much you want to bite off. Just generally, you've already begun. Mel Melanie, you touched on, touched on some of the experience of families in mm -hmm. Longmont. Marta, you did as well. Is there any more we would want to kind of to lay out for listeners, just generally, the experience of families in Boulder County in need of high-quality, reliable child care, formal or informal? I've got a couple of comments. Yeah. Keep in mind, everyone should recognize that I bring the business mindset to the um, situation. So I've done some research on, on Longmont, and I've been able through studies that were um, prepared by the Center for American Progress to identify what's called child care deserts. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the child mm -hmm. care deserts, I, I five or six popped up. And I was, um, I was very amazed and interested to see the, the income levels of those families in that child care desert and the degree that the, the area is a desert. And what it spoke, how it spoke to me was, as you address the problem, and the situation in the crisis in Longmont, I think it would make sense. I always go back to location, 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 and really begin to focus attention to those deserts and create kind of a, a solution-based um, process that would help you earmark. And, and I think what you're going to find out is that many of those areas are working families. You know, they're not the the below poverty level families but it really spoke to me on so i'm working hard and i think this goes to melanie's concept i'm working hard i'm trying to do the best for my children i'm stressing out i'm not a good employee i feel like i'm not a good parent and yet there's no real pathway for supporting those families <laughs> do, do the data you're suggesting, or you're, you've looked at, suggest that, that we are a desert, a child. There are care? there are some deserts. Yes, I can I can tell you the areas. They're they're done by census tract. So it's in the, Longmont, we have child care yes. deserts. Well, that's an important yeah. uh, uh, frame to to, to take with, with us. Yeah, yeah. In this conversation. <laughs> I think though it's also important. And I don't. I haven't looked at the data you're talking about. So when you're when you're considering a child care desert, is that a desert of licensed care providers? It is a desert of licensed care okay. providers. So the yeah. information speaks to me in one particular area. There has to be a huge element of FFNN, family, yeah. friend, and neighbor, mm -hmm. because these parents are working. Yeah. yeah. And, and, I, and I never want to presume what the quality is going to be, but I'm, I, I know there are loving arrangements, and thank goodness for your organization, it could have some very high quality. Mm -hmm. But we should learn from that. So if, t talk about what might not show up in the data. Uh, that reflects the work that you've done. Yeah, so when we know, when we look at data around child care, even um, kids count that happens here in Colorado, it focuses on licensed because it's easier to track. We can, we have the registry of licensed care providers, we have the Qualistar ratings, or the um, Colorado Shines rating, excuse me. But what we don't have, because it's almost virtually impossible to track, is who are the FFN care providers? And the reason why it's so challenging to incorporate FFN care when we're doing, when we're looking at data with child care is because there is no registry. There's no licensure. People are operating out of the goodness of their heart because they have the space, because they have the time. 
Um, and so, and some, some FFN care providers are absolutely outstanding, just like some licensed care providers are outstanding, but there's always opportunity for growth in all areas. And I think that when, we, when we're talking about child care deserts, um, it's, it's absolutely important to recognize those child care deserts as those are also the flourishing opportunities for FFM care. Sure. You know, I think um, here in Longmont, there's several areas where the majority of the providers that we work with <clears throat> are the providers in that area because there aren't any more licensed spots available at all, or yeah. there isn't even a center that's close enough for the families to take advantage of. And we're going to, I've got to, we're going to come back to that. What, what assumptions can we make about total numbers and need and capacity because th those are huge both the numbers and the and the options are huge both in this community and the rest of boulder county um any other perspectives here from uh just in terms of uh what our options and experience is like in in longmont Mar marty you you've You've experienced it trying to, you know, find your way along both as a mom and as a business person. Right, and I think um, so. The coalition that we've been working on over the last year, this tends to be the conversation, yeah. right? And and I know in my own personal experience um, that finance was an issue, finding a, a care, I mean, even finding a facility. But for in the community that because I work, about ninety percent of my clients are not, uh, monolingual Spanish speakers and or bilingual families. So there's a whole other avenue that we haven't touched on. We might not even get to based on a lot of um, questions and great conversation. But there is a sector of our community um, in a multicultural and a multilingual um, need, and there's an underlying thread there of trust. Mm -hmm. And all parents, um, and Megan, speak for myself, I want to be able to leave my child in a place where I trust yep. they're going to be cared for. Um, I hope that they're going to be academically, you know, challenged in some way. But I also, um, you know, those referral partners we talk about in our community is so important. And, you know, how we line this up with, you know, we look at it just from a data standpoint. We look at it just from a number standpoint. We look at a facility standpoint. But there is a bigger topic here about how do we ensure that families can really trust where they're going to leave, whether it's in our family friend neighbor or if it's in our facilities, whether it's licensed or unlicensed. Yeah. And, and again, I think that's why the family village is so unique. And when you have families together that are creating these opportunities, um, how do we use that pilot and, and do something more with it that's going to include all sectors of our community? Right? Yeah, yeah. Right. From the moment <clears throat> they're born, right, they're, they are learning immediately and constantly mm -hmm. and and that learning and the curiosity uh it, it occurs when they're safe uh when they're uh supported right and when parents are comfortable uh with the settings in which their children are being cared for so. well and i think melly touched on it a little bit and the other aspect of this is a mental health conversation yeah. too for a parent who and we look at you know when i'm looking at the data of where are you know boulder county but it could be you know a statewide conversation is where are our parents working what does that commute look like mm -hmm. what does that create then yeah. from a pressure and this conversation of kind of failure as a parent there's all these different pieces that sure. are all attached and why this topic is so important yeah well and also let's not forget now <clears throat> longmont's considered a boom town so we have people yeah. moving here rapidly and as a mom and as a business owner in this sort of child care providing world um I see posts every day, multiple times a day from people who are planning to move here or do live here, um, but haven't yet found a connection. And they don't have, they, they don't have friends, they don't have family. So that network of where do I go to get care becomes really reliant on a bunch of, it's beautiful in a way, strangers on a social media site saying, here's someone I recommend, or yeah. here's an in-home child care provider that you can't find on a da database. I mean, I know care.com, some parents use that. Um, but it becomes even more of a, I have to jump into this new living experience and the places that I would normally say I was, were trustworthy in terms of being licensed, um, I have to now go on uh, the advice of strangers, really, to, to decide where I'm going to take my kids. Um, so I think some of this is about how do we build that community for these new families that move here? And that's what I hope Family Village can be and anything else that sort of evolves from it. 
Um, because once you have that trust in people because you know them, then it's much easier to say, hey, I've got my, my aunt is now looking to provide care in her home and she'd be excellent. You can meet her. And um, I think it just, it, there are, there's a lot of gray area that we don't really know. And how many parents do want full-time care? How many just want part-time or as needed? And there's really not a lot of opportunities in all of Boulder County, but I think probably in the state for I need care today. I didn't know that I needed care yesterday. So um, I think there's there's a lot of creativity, I think, that has to come to the table in, in solving this problem because it's not just building more child care facilities in the traditional way. It's finding ways that we can build community networks and, you know, the more um, uh, babysitting co-ops where it's parents that come together and they take turns taking each other's children so that there isn't a financial burden at all, but it just means, you, you know, that means a day that you need to actually watch seven or eight kids. Um, so anyways, it's, I think it's a very nuanced question, like about, we know what's in, in um, licensed care. We can maybe have some idea through your organization of what's happening in terms of friends and friends and family network. But I think there's a lot of people that are not even showing up in any statistics because they don't even know where to turn. They don't know how to even start looking for care. So I want to drill down just a little bit on that part of the question. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot that, what part of what I've learned is that um, getting your arms around the, what the actual data are is is a challenge because the data sets are so disparate. There's no one place uh, that we can go to to answer questions about total number of kids in the community who are who are are in or not in any kind of um, care facility and the nature of that. Um, so last spring there was a uh, a mayor's summit that several of you were uh, involved with. Uh, that was followed in September with a, a, a data collection activity that was part of uh, the follow-on to a, a Senate bill that was passed in the last legislative session. What was interesting, the data in both of those suggested that we have a pretty significant challenge in Longmont. And these are just gross approximations. So. Don't anybody at this table or who might be listening <laughs> hold me to the, to the fine emails. points of here. Yeah. Um, but here's the imp at least the impression I was left with is that we probably have 5,000 kids, um, in, in, at least in the, the geography of the St. Brain Valley School District, 5,000 children between ages 0 and 5. Uh, and of those 5-year-olds among that 5,000, there are those who are not yet in kindergarten. So these are kids who would be in child care or early childhood formal or informal learning opportunities. And that about we can account for probably 60% of that 5,000 to be part of a, a, an FFN network or a, in, a, in a formal setting, licensed or unlicensed. Now, how, how accurate is that number? But it, but it would not be inconsistent with the idea of deserts to mm -hmm. some degree. That does leave, if you think about the numbers, 2,000 kids today and every day in settings where we're not certain what they're experiencing. And, and, and I'm certain many of, her, many of them are experiencing the kind of care you'd like to have where parents can be confident. I do fear that there are too many who aren't. Uh, and whatever that number is, uh, are those to whom we owe something, right? So could, could we just talk about what are, the, what are the consequences? What does it mean to a community, to a society, both short-term and long-term, if whatever that number is, whether it's 2,000 or some smaller number, uh, what are the implications for the children, for their families, and for society if we don't do more and better to ensure that whatever that number is, they're either with a, a prepared friend or family care provider, or in a co-op, or in a formal licensed setting? What, what are the consequences if we don't do that? The consequences are enormous. I mean, there's consequences to the family, there's consequences to the parent, there's consequences to the city council's goal for economic development, there's consequences to the ability for the child to to develop in their social and emotional learning and their academics. And I think one of the things that, that strikes me most is we, the, what is the need? Why do we even have the need for childcare? Because we are still operating in, a, in an archaic system that does not support two working parents in a household or does not support a single parent working. And because of that, 
even though we have, when, when children even get to kindergarten, for example, there is still a need for childcare when the school day is over because parents are still supposed to be at work until five, but then how do they pick up their kids at 3.30? So then they're still figuring out, how do I get my child cared for in this hour and a half that I can't leave work? Mm-hmm. Yeah, add that to the, <laughs> add that to the number I, I shared you know? a few minutes and ago, so, yes. Yeah. And I think that when we are, what, what I do want to re- acknowledge is Longmont is doing a lot to address this. More than, more than most any other community in Colorado right now, Longmont is really focused because of the commitment of the city council to ensuring that there is attention brought to this. I mean, the fact that there's this type of podcast happening is enormous. And if we don't take advantage right now when we have the opportunity to use the dollars that the Longmont City Council has put forward, to use the expertise that's even just sitting at this table right here, to make sure that we are engaging businesses that Epic is doing a fantastic job with, to say we have to, in order to address this problem, it's going to take about 10 different prongs. There's not a single solution <coughs> to Complex. making sure mm-hmm. that these 2,000 kids are safe yeah. or, in a, or in, a, in an environment that's going to be stimulating their minds. You know, we need to rely on FFN. We need to expand licensure. We need to make sure that, that businesses start understanding that investing in child care is, is ultimately better for their own bottom line. We need to make sure that that the, the city and the other, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, you know, I'm to stop. I'm going to allow everyone to <laughs> I keep going. going. Well, and I want to add on to what you said, Lorena, because there's, I mean, we have this, this, this 2,000 number, right? But the other reality that we have in Boulder County and, and in our state, because we're you know, the amazing mm-hmm. part of the country, is that on a national average, if you look at the cost to have a child care provider, national average is around 25000 In Boulder County, that same position is about 30000 mm-hmm. And so we have this, we know we have a need right now, and the reality is that those child care providers are also being pulled into other areas of employment And I hear that all the time from different nonprofits that are also facing the same thing. And so if we are not careful, and we've talked about this in our coalition meetings, we are also going to see more closures of child care facilities that we have right now. So we have to be, and I love what you're saying, because we have to be very vigilant um, because that 2,000 number is more likely to grow versus lower if we don't get very active um, with all of community members to to find some solutions that are going to help. I, I think that's why, from my perspective, and keep in mind, I'm totally biased about the business community, but now is the time to have those very difficult conversations. And my experience has been, is what was a difficult conversation five years ago is now a five-minute conversation. Hmm. So they're beginning to understand all of the brain science, all the economic reasons. What they're, the gap is, is what is the most logical place for them to, to be active. And I think that's the question if through the city council we can develop kind of a pathway. Mm-hmm. I don't believe there's going to be the, the challenges that we saw several years ago. I want to reinforce, um, Lorena, you, you touched on what's different today. Uh, a, a generation ago, we didn't have the absolute need for two, two workers in every household, right? right? The economics of life today have drawn moms and dads into the workplace. The number of single parents, right, who obviously are going to be in the workplace. Add to that what we've learned about brain science. Uh, why, why do kids need to be places today when they didn't need to be a generation ago? Well, they needed to be there a generation ago. We just didn't understand how the brain works mm-hmm. and why it's so critical today to, ev- to, over- to, to address what become deficits, mm-hmm. right? Not in terms of, of abilities, but in terms of vocabulary or the kind of brain development that occurs to get them ready by the time they get to kindergarten. So um, it, 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 just imagine what would it be like if all of our five-year-olds showed up to the St. Frank Valley School District school ready and we weren't having to overcome deficits in vocabulary or planning skills and those kinds of things. Think of the number of special ed referrals that, that decline and using those resources differently. Uh, think of how you'd use uh, compensatory uh, Title I dollars differently for enrichment. Uh, and what, what life options are presented to those, to those kids. It, this, the the storyline goes on for decades and decades and decades. Adults who make better decisions. They live longer, healthier lives, more productive. 
the returns on these investments are, are pretty profound. But we've got to we got to make some progress here, and let's talk about you. you several of you have referred to what's going on in Longmont. Um, this this isn't going to get solved by the city council. The city council teed it up. Mm -hmm. It's going to get to the degree that it's a solution. We're going to make progress on a very complex problem because of everybody who comes to this. You are all involved in a in a coalition that has come together in Longmont, uh, and part of the story is about that coalition. Uh, Lorena, you mentioned that what's going on in Longmont is unusual. I think it comes along very seldom that the, the variety of interests that come together to address this particular issue doesn't happen very often, but it is now. So talk a bit about what, how you've come to that coalition, what you think of the work that's being done, and what would you say to others in terms of how they get involved from the business perspective, from the business community, from a parental perspective, from a provider perspective, from a business, your business perspective, and from your work as a consultant and as an advocate, mm -hmm. and from policy. Talk about your experiences and, and why should you, anybody should care about this. So I will just speak very briefly on this. Um, there is, so there is this wonderful coalition of community activists here in Longmont and teachers and um, policymakers here in Longmont that are convening in order to come up with the multitude of solutions that are necessary to address this issue here in Longmont. And this coalition is growing every single meeting. Um, and I think one of the, one of the reasons why um, CSPC is part of it um, is because this is what we do you know this is when we are able to actually engage with people who are directly impacted by this issue whether it's the business community or the parents or the schools then we know that we're able to come up with robust equitable solutions that have the perspective of everyone who's going to be impacted involved and that's really important for for me personally and it's also very extremely important for the organization CSPC to maintain with its with its essence of why we exist. Yeah, yeah. I think um, so. I joined this coalition after speaking to Tim and introducing him to uh, Family Village, um, and we immediately recognized there are not a lot of parents at this coalition, and there are a lot of reasons for that. And it's all the reasons we've been talking about. Parents are stressed. Parents don't have childcare to show up at a meeting. I mean, one, one of the first meetings we brought, I think it was five or six parents from Family Village, and we brought our children with us. And it was disruptive, of course, because that's what, that's what you would expect when children show up, but that's the statement that we knew we needed to make. Mm -hmm. We aren't at the table to the degree that we need to be. Um, and the needs for childcare have changed in, in ways that we haven't touched on it, it, it immensely today, and that is that a lot of parents are able to work from home. A lot of parents are working more flexible schedules. Um, parents are working overnight shifts. That's not something new. But what is happening in terms of childcare in these kind of less, um, it used to be exceptions, but now it's becoming a more, a, more, a more larger population of people who are not needing the same things that were needed 10, 15 years, even five years ago. Um, so that's a challenge. We've moved a lot of these meetings to Family Village for this reason, so that we have childcare on site available to parents that want to show up. But um, I think it, it demonstrates the degree to which, which this is a problem, and that we can't even, as parents of young children, be at the table to provide the solutions, help provide the solutions to make this not be a problem for the next generation. So um, we're definitely changing it, but I think that's one thing I would say parents listening, anybody that's a parent and a business provider, we need your, your voice at the table. I mean, I can bring my perspective, some of our villagers can, can come, but we have very specific needs that other parents don't have. And um, how can we as a community provide the forum to have these conversations in ways that parents are able to show up and, and be at the table um, to feel empowered? Because the other thing I, I, I believe deep down is that becoming a parent brings a, a new wisdom to life. And it's not just about raising our own children, but it's about what do we need as a community to feel safe and to feel secure. Mm -hmm. And I think many times in my experience, 
parents feel like those ideas, those thoughts, you know, this business came because I got pissed and I just decided I have to build it. But so many parents don't feel empowered to do that. They don't have the resources to be able to take the time off of work to build a new business to be the solution for the problem. Um, but I believe many of us as moms have amazing ideas mm -hmm. that will solve this problem, that will solve many other problems in our society. But unless we do what we can as a culture to start making it possible for those parents to be at the table, then these conversations will just keep going and going and going. We might provide a solution or two, but we're not actually addressing the bottom line, which is that you're right, this is an unnatural way to be taking care of our children, to require that two parents work and not have that really comfortable, safe network of the old fashioned village where uh, I could work because my aunt or my grandparent or my cousins or all of the above are available to start to help raise my kid with me. That's not the world we live in anymore. And we talk about all the time that because two parents are working, you don't know your neighbors because you don't have the time to be networking with your neighbors. All you have time to do is get home, get food on the table, get the kids to bed. And so what that does is it, it provides this distrust of the community around you. So if you don't know who your neighbors are, then you don't feel comfortable with your child walking down the street. Mm -hmm. And there's this, 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 we talk about mental health, there is this constant fear in parents of if I'm not with my child, something terrible is going to happen. Not just in a child care providing situation, but just in life in general. And I think that's where the answer isn't just both parents work full time and we put our children into child care facilities. It's we have to build community so that we feel generally safe raising our children where we do. And that's where I think Longmont, having these conversations, we have the opportunity to be the forefront of what it looks like to be um, taking care of our children. You know, some of it is about education, but some of it is just about a general sense of safety in life. Those zero to three, we don't need to worry about teaching them necessarily, but we need to make sure they feel safe and loved. And parents that are stressed have a hard time providing that safety and love, even if they try. So I think it's, it's, it's from an economic standpoint, from a cost of living standpoint, there's so much um, about this conversation that glosses over the underlying problem, which is that we are not um, we're not taking care of one another. As, mm -hmm. as, as parents, we feel isolated. And even though we have social media and we can talk to someone 24 hours a day on social media about our challenges as parents, the, the, the closeness of a community and the knowingness that we're safe here and we know our neighbors and we're in this together, um, I think is, is part of the conversation that we need to be having. I think more parents at the table brings, will bring that to light because I think we all feel that. Yeah. I, I would say what you just described is is neither a problem nor a solution. It is a much deeper yes. set of uh, social conditions. Yes. And building on that, I mean, that's a huge aspiration that's spot on. We also have to address some, some issues uh, like the decline in providers and yes. why and, and, and the cost and the benefits of valuing the work in this space like we do, do other industry yes. sectors. Right. Anybody want to take that one on? From a teacher perspective, I could take that one all day <laughs> long. Um, it's the same issue that we've seen in Colorado from a statewide um, issue of we are not valuing, valuing the people that we are asking to dedicate their yeah. lives to care for our kids. Yeah. And it's really at all ages. That's a bigger issue. And that's a, you know, a statewide issue, but certainly one of the pieces, so I was invited to join the coalition, I think initially for a couple of reasons. One, from a business standpoint, because the question then was, was this group going to tackle some of this new legislation and really look for a special district tax? Um, and the other reason I was brought on was to look at it from a consulting standpoint, which you touched on a little bit, because I've been facilitating human-centered design project, um, a national cohort for a community foundation in Boulder County. So it goes back to that same piece, and we heard it in September at that last meeting, um, the opening remark started with feedback we'd gotten from community members who said, this is not an accessible time. I'm a child care provider. I would like to be in the room and the 3 o'clock meeting yeah. or 3.30 <laughs> meeting doesn't work. And yeah. that, to me, is a bigger issue of when we ask and we want people to be in the room to be able to participate. We have to move into a new system that allows people to do that, and that's going to take some creative solutions. And the second piece is the business standpoint of how do we encourage 
business owners and big employers and small employers to really talk with their their families to figure out what are the needs here locally because some parents may not want the same old um, the the same old uh, rewards for working for example and I've seen it and heard it from a lot of young folks who are saying hey instead of giving me a bonus check at the end of the year right that's kind of an old school why don't you give me uh, you know, add more to PTO or mm-hmm. add, give me some or let me go and get trained so that I can add some more income to it, whatever it might be, but that some of those creative solutions are in all sectors, right? But I, I agree that we just need to have more people in um, at the table. And so that invitation obviously is there for people to figure We're going to get to that invitation Perfect. before we're finished here, just a minute. <laughs> I'd like to add and kind of pile on to what you were saying mm-hmm. earlier is that we do need to elevate the profession our professional early childhood individuals. Mm -hmm. And I think it's two-pronged, and I can just, I just tell everything in my life is a story because I experience it somewhere. But professionals don't value themselves because we don't value them. And I look at it from uh, the regulatory perspective, and the reason that probably some of the, and many of the child care providers are not licensed is because of the regulatory issues. Mm -hmm. But when we start telling them we have to regulate everything that they do, pretty soon they say, but that's not relevant to what I want to be as an early childhood provider and leave the environment. So that's an issue that that needs to be addressed. And I think that the business community, if we can get them properly educated, can be very strong advocates because they don't like regulations either. They're kindred spirits, so to speak, (laughs) to say, what can we do differently? And so then I, I go to the other side where I've had a lot of background in policy and legislative issues. And it was just the other day where an individual came up to me and said, child care providers aren't, uh, they don't have a business license. So we want to run a bill that says they don't need to have a business license. And I said, time out. We're trying to professionalize that profession. And we say, you know, everybody else has to have a business license. So if we give them an exemption, are we really doing them a favor if we're trying to create this higher level of, ex, uh, of perspective that the community has of them. I said, there's a way you can get to that point without providing exemptions, just embed a business license into the licensing process. Mm-hmm. So I, I, don't, I think when, we're, when some people are trying to help, they, they're not helping, but they don't realize that they're business people just like everybody else, and we want to treat them the same, and we want them to have the same... Um, respect and ultimately compensation. So I think we have to be careful in how we try to make changes to make sure that we aren't kind of stepping on our own well, toe. If I may jump in really quick, I think the fact that child care is a business is a problem. I mean, the fact that we look at child care and early childhood education <clears throat> as a for profit model is why we are in a place we are right now. If we were to actually consider childcare as early childhood education and wrap it into our overall education system, you know, then we would have more validity towards what is ECE. You know, it wouldn't be something where we have to rely on all these like um, these, this hodgepodge of options for childcare, but it could actually be a model that is couched under department even. I mean, where does child care fit? Some people say it's education. Some people say it's human services. I don't know. So maybe mm-hmm. we'll take it this year. Maybe you'll take it next year. I think that we need to systematize where child, where early childhood education should fall and expand early childhood education beyond kindergarten, beyond preschool, to start at age zero. And I think that when, as long as we continue to allow child care and allow our children to to be another model of of profit building then we're never going to get to a place where really what is the purpose of early childhood education and child care it's to actually support the development of these children and we're not going to get there i'm going to i'm going to use that as a segue into into a closing here, mm-hmm. and I want to invite you all. We've made reference to this consortium. Uh, I want to. I want you all to extend what whatever invitation you want to, whether it's this consortium or any other aspect of the work you're doing. If people, if this motivates anybody to want to enlist in in this cause, what would you mm-hmm. encourage them to do? 
who would you encourage them to contact? Um, and, and then they can follow up and, you know, we're all easy to reach. Um, but I, I, I will say it, it, that, that the, the consortium conversation is addressing both of these, right? What is it on the, from the business side or what are the options that you, you think about this as a system or an institution, not unlike our K-12 system, just an extension to birth, right? What does that look like and what are the options? And indeed, there are some options to take it on that way, whether or not we have the political will and the, and the fortitude and the, poli and the political savvy to, to move that forward, we'll have to see. But that's on the table. In this in this coalition, so we're gonna we're gonna close it. How would you like to invite people to join you in this cause? Well, from the Colorado Steward Parent Coalition perspective, um, you can join CSPC by if you want to be a trained provider, jump on board. You can become a member of CSPC. But the other thing is also just if you're in this area. Um, and you can make it, if you can make it to these meetings, do, because your perspective is vital to making sure that we do come away with equitable, broad-based solutions that do take into consideration all the different perspectives. I imagine you're going to be putting some information about how to like reach out to so-and-so email. We'll have to see what the Longmont <laughs> Public Media is willing to do with that. <laughs> I, I will say that, th this, that uh, I'm not certain when these, is this is going to get posted and you know, when people view. Uh, but right now, the second Monday of each month at 3 o'clock in the afternoon at 13, what's the address? 13 <laughs> is where the consortia, everybody who's involved uh, or the coalition meets. And there are working groups uh, that meet on different schedules. But if anybody wanted to come just to get a taste of it, find out where and how to plug in, that would be a time. And understand, in fact, on the next time this group meets, we'll talk about meeting times because 3 o'clock in the afternoon doesn't meet for, nope. for, for a lot of working families. So, um, but that's a topic for that agenda. But just know that there are these opportunities. Who would I'd like to add to what Lorena just said? Mine is just kind of a general thing that we right now are working to create um, a no-cost ability for businesses and especially small businesses to say, oh, I understand the problem and I'm there to support you. I may not be able to, you know, pay for my family or for my employees' childcare or things like that, but I'm there to create a business voice and try to help the business community come through. So we're doing that through letters of support or quotes. Because I say the quotes are great because they're kind of the gift that keeps on giving. Mm -hmm. But if we can get enough businesses and particularly small businesses to basically just stand up and say, I get it. I don't have a solution. I don't know what your solution is going to be, but I want to, be, I want to go on notice as being part of, part of the concerned community. One of the working groups, by the way, mm -hmm. is focused just on these questions right? and yes. working with the business yeah, community. Right. So. Yeah, you took mine. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, he did. Not you. But. <laughs> So, and I think that's important for, for viewers and listeners to know because this group was a huge umbrella um, and we've broken it down into three different groups. So my particular request, because I'm working with, on the business side, is really that we need to have some more business perspectives and not just necessarily business owners, but also people who've been in that space mm -hmm. and certainly our entrepreneurial world because, again, I think that the way um, employment is working is... Right now, we're, we're focusing on something that we know, and really our jobs are going to look completely different, um, you know, two to five years and certainly <clears throat> 10 to 15 years in Longmont and in the county. And so folks who are on the edge of that who have some perspectives could be really helpful to, to guide that conversation. And the data is also the piece. So if there's folks out there who have some of this data, who have some ideas about how to collect, because we don't have the numbers. We don't even know what the ask is. We don't have a specific... Um, number yet of, of not only all the kids specifically that are um, being serviced by these different programs, but also who's not being serviced and what the cost would be. Again, what it might look like today is going to be different going forward. So <clears throat> all those requests would be, would be really helpful yeah. to join in. Yeah. And, and like I mentioned, I think we, need, we do need parents at the table. And um, if you can't make it to the meetings, you can always show up at the village from 9 to 3, um, Monday through Friday, because we have these conversations all the time. Um, and I think it's important that we have as many varying experiences of child care at the table, as well as what are the solutions that you've come up with, because a lot of these parents are very creative. Um, but if we can kind of put 
some bang behind these ideas and do something with them by having those ideas at the table at these meetings. I can represent whoever I can't be there. Um, but I think we just need to have these conversations, which is why this is so important. Um, because I think it just feels like we're just treading water and we just have to keep surviving until our kids get to an age where we don't have to worry anymore about this. Um, I think the answer is not wait. I think the answer is solutions no. now. So um, we do need all of the, those perspectives that are going to be different than probably some of the things we talked about today. So yeah. anybody who's, who watches this video or listens to this podcast, the second Monday of each month, 3 o'clock, at St. Saint, Saint Stephen's Episcopal Church, 1303 South Bronx. It's where this coalition is meeting. Uh, who knows where it goes after that? I'm certain we'll find meeting times that work for a broader cross-section. Oh, yeah, there are ideas that are, that are currently, there are working groups that are coming together around both problems and solutions. Any idea, it's not just those three, every idea that somebody would bring, uh, well, that coalition will be interested in. And there'll be others, I'm certain, who with whom new volunteers would find common cause to help work towards solutions. And if you do that, you get a chance to work with the kind of talent that's at this table, and that's a rare and unique opportunity. And it has been a, a unique opportunity for me this morning, so thanks to each of you for, you. Uh, for sharing your time and your expertise. Like we said, it's a story that needs to be told, and I'm, I'm so pleased and honored that you were here to tell it. Thank you. Thank you. That's your backstory, and the third of these podcasts on early childhood education and child care in Longmont.